Um, our next speaker is Magdalena Macro Dimitri, and she is from the University of Cambridge. She'll be speaking about conservation and thermal comfort in historic buildings. Are they compatible? She is a PhD candidate at Cambridge University's Department of Architecture. Her research interests lie in the field of sustainability of existing buildings and heritage conservation. She holds an MS degree in environmental design and engineering, um, awarded uh, from the University College London. And she completed her undergraduate degree from the School of Architectural Engineering at the National Technical University of Athens in 2008. She holds several positions in Cambridge University societies and organizations, and I think um, in this case can truly inspire our students who are here with her many activities on campus um, in a variety of different organizations, some focused on sustainability and some in other areas. So her background, which is quite impressive, um, well prepares her for the study in this area, and we look forward to her presentation. Here. Okay. okay. So, hello. Um, so, my presentation actually aims to discuss uh, the main factors that affect the sustainability of historic buildings, uh, which I consider in this presentation to be uh, the energy consumption of these buildings, uh, the conservation problems and the human factor in terms of thermal comfort. Uh, so I'm going to start talking at, uh, a little bit about the context of this research, uh, why I'm focusing uh, in church buildings. Uh, then we'll talk about, about some improvement options that uh, may help in uh, the sustainable development in the historic built environment. Uh, the conservation problems, and I will conclude with some uh, results of my research uh, in 4K studies in Cambridge. So, to start with the context, um, the Stern Review report concluded that the climate change uh, is uh, possibly the most urgent problem that requires immediate uh, attention, and it's believed that uh, the most of environmental problems of our planet that our planet is facing at the moment um, are due to human activities. Now, uh, the building sector accounts uh, for 40% uh, of global energy consumption, which is translated into about 30% of carbon emissions. And heating space uh, has been found to play a key role uh, into energy consumption. Especially in the UK in 2006, the, the public sector was found to be responsible for about 28% uh, of uh, CO2 emissions. And therefore, we realized that reducing the carbon emissions of the existing building stock is a viable option. And if listed buildings, such as churches, are preserved and reconditioned, uh, they have the potential to become environmentally more friendly. Uh, they will be able to satisfy modern society's needs, and thus they will be uh, usable. And they will also do this way a huge contribution to urban sustainability in general. And um, actually, um, it is also very important to think about the embodied uh, energy and therefore the embodied carbon contained uh, in these buildings. And as you can see in this graph, uh, there is about 24% uh, uh, of embodied carbon that is spent on building services, uh, which figure actually has the potential to uh, substantially reduce uh, these uh, carbon emissions uh, if uh, the um, uh, adequate uh, measures are applied to historic structures. Now, um, conservation and sustainability are also um, related in a broader ecological uh, sense. And reusing and conserving historic environment serves sustainability because of several reasons. I have selected here the most important ones, uh, according to me, which is uh, that uh, this way uh, demolition uh, waste uh, is reduced. Uh, the sense of place has the potential to be further reinforced. 
uh, the historic buildings um, also uh, often have greater economic value than uh, new structures. And um, also conservation of uh, historic buildings can boost uh, the growth of uh, local economies. And finally, uh, conserving the historic legacy uh, uh, can also uh, become a local educational source. Now, um, my research lies under the umbrella of sustainability in the historic built environment, and uh, it seeks to provide guidance to managers and curators of these buildings um, for decision making on adoption of um, modern uh, heating and ventilation strategies. Um, I'm focusing specifically on church buildings because um, they are the they are complex structures and the most representative uh, type of uh, large hall structures. Uh, and large hall structures uh, pose particular difficulties in achieving uh, effective space heating and managing uh, humidity uh, levels, air movements, and heat currents within the big volume of uh, such uh, devices. At the same time, now heating strategies in church buildings vary a lot. Um, and the same stands for uh, the type of several heating systems that are currently being used in these buildings. And most churches also have infrequent occupation, which also impacts uh, the operation of heating and therefore the microclimate conditions. Also, this research is inspired by the Church of England's environmental action, which is called um, Shrinking the Footprint, and it aims to gradually reduce uh, uh, the carbon emissions of uh, the whole church premises by 80% by the year 2050. However, this is um, a very challenging target because two-thirds of the churches in the UK are listed buildings and therefore uh, conservation issues require, require uh, careful consideration. Uh, in particular, um, it was found that uh, during the year 2006 and 2007, uh, the whole uh, church uh, premises of uh, the Church of England um, actually uh, it emitted uh, over 330,000 tons of uh, uh, carbon dioxide. And 65% of these carbon emissions were attributed to churches and halls, while heating and lighting was playing a key role in this energy consumption. Of course, there are several improvement options uh, that can be applied uh, to church edifices in terms of energy consumption and conservation. Uh, or, uh, but here in this section of the presentation, I'm going to focus on the energy uh, efficiency improvement options, actually. And we have two kinds of improvement options, two general categories, the passive options and the more active measures. Um, the challenge with uh, churches and in general with the historic structures are that these structures uh, were, are traditionally very leaky structures, very air permeable. This means that these buildings have been constructed to breathe, to allow uh, moisture come in the building and then be extracted from the building to, um, uh, to ensure uh, that the excess moisture is removed from the interior. Uh, of the building, and for this reason, traditionally, uh, hygroscopic materials have been used uh, to the building cell. Uh, therefore, it is very challenging because we can't obviously apply the same um, techniques uh, of uh, passive um, um, environmental adaptation of these buildings, such as uh, insulation of the, wa uh, the walls or um, uh, or making these buildings um, too much airtight, uh, because we need to ensure uh, that um, the, there is uh, still moisture movement in and out of the buildings, and the excess moisture is removed successfully. So, 
for several reasons now, uh, there is a different priority a list of measures that uh, can be applied in church buildings. So first in the priority uh, is the change of the behavior of users. By providing feedback to the users, you can make them realize uh, how, um, uh, realize the energy use patterns of their buildings and uh, potentially uh, they can uh, be more uh, consider uh, considerate in terms of energy consumption within their building. Um, this, the second in the list is um, is installing uh, smart meters and uh, monitoring of uh, energy consumption in these uh, devices, which actually also contribute to the change of behavior of, of the users because they provide constant feedback of the energy consuming uh, activities inside the building. Uh, then we have uh, the um, technological solutions, uh, which are combined with the system controls, actually. Um, and then it's quite low in the list, the fabric improvements, because actually having a lot of fabric improvements in church buildings might not be as, feasi uh, as feasible uh, due to many conservation issues. Uh, obviously, um, applying insulation on walls uh, may be too disruptive of the structure, of the historic structure, and uh, therefore uh, fabric conservation might not be possible to be achieved. Um, and then lower in the list is uh, the higher uh, investment options for heat and power generation, which includes uh, the low and zero carbon technologies. And they, are, they come quite low in the list because they are very high investment options. Now, uh, there's, this research focusing, uh, is focusing on uh, heating uh, because uh, the, some background research that I have done has revealed that heating is responsible for uh, the most energy usage and is usually associated with particular conservation uh, problems in churches. So, um, traditionally, uh, the vast majority of churches uh, was not receiving heat of any sort. This is a late 20th uh, century expectation and specifically uh, to have a very uh, high uh, thermal comfort um, expectations. Uh, and heating the churches actually started in the late 19th century, uh, which was actually the Victorian period uh, back in the UK. Uh, now, um, the early heating systems are of two types, basically. Uh, they are localized uh, heating systems, which include fireplaces, uh, stoves, uh, etc. And um, central heating systems, such as low and high pressure wet systems, as well as some hot air systems. Um, the most commonly used contemporary heating systems now are wet systems, uh, warm air uh, heating systems, district or removed uh, radiant heating, and electric heating. While we have a wide variety of heating emitters, such as radiant heaters, ceiling, floor, and wall heating, convective and flueless heaters, direct fresh air heating, local heating, and pew heating. Now, in terms of how uh, heating contributes to the changes in the internal micro microclimate of a church, this image uh, I think is quite uh, characteristic. Um, on the right, uh, we can see the example of uh, central convective uh, heating. And here, um, as we know, heat uh, tends to rise, and in this case, uh, warm air heating or convective or fan assisting heating um, tends to warm up too much the upper part of the church, which is anyway uh, devoid of people. Uh, so the, the heat does not uh, stay within the occupied area of the church. Um, uh, it goes to the upper parts of the church and um, if it is not successfully, uh, if you know the water vapors that are produced uh, by this uh, heating system uh, are not removed uh, successfully, uh, there might be a very intense uh, wet and dry cycles that um, are caused uh, in these parts of the church where a lot of artworks may exist as well. 
while on the left we have the local radiant heating, uh, which appears to be more a uh, cost-effective uh, heating option. And it also tends to keep uh, most of the heat within the occupied area of a church building. But at the same time, it has been found uh, that um, this methodology is not very common and uh, human thermal comfort is uh, so sometimes compromised. It's, it is generally, generally lower. Now, the main factor which is responsible for uh, historic elements deterioration is the moisture. And moisture can be received by historic fabric or artifacts in two ways, either hygroscopicity or uh, condensation. Of course, um, there is also the liquid water penetration that can impact the conservation of, of, of a historic building, and this is uh, due to failure of the building cell or we can have rising damp. There were also studies that have um, concluded that um, heating uh, plays um, a role in uh, controlling the rising damp whenever this happens in, um, in a historic building. Um, Now, lots of deterioration problems are associated with water vapor, and this is uh, because um, when we apply heating into a church, um, there are uh, temperatures and relative uh, humidity fluctuations uh, that uh, can hap that happen, and these fluctuations may be sharp, uh, and especially this happens in the case of intermittent heating. Um, so when we apply uh, heating into a church, uh, water in the ambient air, um, the, the, I mean, uh, the relative humidity uh, drops, and uh, then when we uh, switch off the heating, the relative uh, humidity goes up again. Um, now, this results into the absorption and release of um, moisture uh, from uh, uh, materials uh, and uh, of either artworks or the historic fabric into the ambient air. And if this water in the ambient air fails to be absorbed in, in, uh, by structural elements uh, on time, then the water vapor rises on uh, the cold wall surfaces um, the ceiling or window surfaces, which tend to be uh, much co colder um, uh, surfaces, and it condensates. Uh, this uh, creates many problems, uh, such as uh, salt activity, biodeterioration, and dimensional change of materials. Okay, so... Basically, <clears throat> I am t trying uh, with this research to see if um, there is the potential to balance uh, three factors of uh, the environmentally sustainable performance of uh, historic uh, churches, which are the energy consumption, um, low conservation risk, and uh, thermal comfort in order to provide some advice for decision making for heating systems and strategies. Now, <clears throat> the current research being conducted in Cambridge involves um, four case studies, which are uh, the Great St. Mary's Church, St. Bottle of Church, Queen's Chapel, and All Saints Church. All these churches have uh, different types of uh, heating systems, and they slightly vary in uh, heating strategies. Um, <clears throat> Great St. Mary's Church has a constant central uh, trench heating, which is a low uh, pressure hot water uh, heating system. Um, St. Botolph Church has an intermittent uh, local heating system. Uh, basically, it consists of electric panels embedded on the pews of the church. Queen's College Chapel has a central heating system with water pipes um, that provide radiant heating, and these run on a windows level. 
Um, and all sensors has constant central heating system, again, trans heating system. But the difference with Gretz and Mary's church is that um, the heating here is thermostatically controlled to keep the church at conservation conditions of uh, 11.5 to 12.5 degrees. So um, uh, basically here I have regressed the temperature against the relative humidity uh, during, um, in these four case studies during a typical uh, Sundays. Uh, in order to evaluate uh, the environmental conditions occurring inside the church uh, when there is high occupancy and usually the heating system is on in all case studies. And we can see here that St. Bottle Church that has an intermittent uh, heating operation uh, tends to have very dispersed uh, results in comparison with all the other case studies uh, that uh, fall outside the conservation range, uh, range and mostly outside the comfort range of the graph. I have included these two graphs as these uh, summarize some monitoring results and these are uh, monthly averages of uh, temperatures uh, occurring uh, in the occupancy levels and the higher parts of, the, of uh, my case studies. And basically the image here uh, say, says that um, uh, there are no significant variations in the conditions either in the occupancy level or in uh, the higher levels. But this is a very broad image, and this includes only monthly average of uh, temperatures. If we zoom in uh, these results, uh, we can have graphs like this, which uh, provide a summary of the results during a typical Sunday in these case studies. This is a graph that shows uh, the environmental conditions at the low level of occupancy. But this is a graph that shows uh, the environmental conditions at the upper parts of the churches, where we can see that uh, there are quite a lot of uh, variations and fluctuations of humidity uh, and temperature. Um, I tried also to confirm uh, the previous results which have been obtained by monitoring the um, um, environmental conditions uh, of the churches uh, with uh, portable data loggers uh, with some infrared uh, thermography studies. And here I just give an example of Great St. Mary's Church where we can see the variations of temperatures as we go up uh, uh, in the as we go, yes, uh, up in the, in the church from uh, bottom to the upper parts of the ceiling. And, okay, I'm not gonna stay a lot in this graph. Here it summarizes, yes, uh, I'm gonna conclude, yeah. Um, this is the estimated annual energy consumption in these four case studies. We can see that most of the energy is indeed attributed uh, to heating. Um, and this is the thermal comfort study uh, that has been conducted in these case studies, uh, which basically measured the perception of thermal comfort condition in these churches. Uh, we can see that although quite low temperatures may occur in some of the case studies, uh, we have a distribution um, um, of um, uh, thermal uh, comfort perception uh, throughout the graph, uh, which means that a lot of subjects uh, are quite satisfied by the conditions, although it feels, uh, it, it, uh, although they seem to be quite cold conditions. Um, uh, and basically, uh, the same happens when we ask the subjects to evaluate the performance of, uh, of these case studies in terms of uh, heating systems. And um, so basically, the thermal comfort study uh, has concluded that, that um, Sorry, uh, it has concluded basically that uh, the, 
The thermal comfort expectations in, uh, in church buildings uh, are not as high as we expect. Uh, at the moment, there is a lot of um, uh, guidance notes uh, that um, actually identify uh, the, the design temperatures for church buildings up to 19 degrees, which is a very high value. But uh, the regular occupiers of the church buildings actually uh, feel that their environment is quite satisfactory, and therefore there is still the potential to balance the factors of thermal comfort conservation uh, and energy consumption of these buildings by actually reassessing uh, the design standards of uh, these edifices. And um, just to some concluding remarks, um, uh, heating should uh, serve uh, the human thermal comfort as locally as possible and should ensure the minimum uh, interruption into the microclimate uh, conditions, into the natural microclimate conditions of the building. And heating and historic churches should uh, actually um, not cause uh, uh, a lot of uh, short-term variations in uh, temperature and relative humidity uh, that would have a long-term impact to the conservation of uh, the fabric and historic artworks. Thank you very much. <laughs>